Um, I'm Joni Guzman. I'm the project manager for Mission Lifeline Stroke Montana. And Mission Lifeline Stroke Montana is made possible by a generous gift from the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust. Um, and our goal is to help strengthen Montana's stroke system of care. And so we're, um, you know, working on every link in our chain of survival from public awareness through EMS, into our referral hospitals and stroke centers, and even into post-acute care and survivor support. So if you are interested in participating in our project, I'll put my information in the chat and you can send me an email and I'd love to meet with you. Um, also on March 31st, we'll be doing another Montana Fast Chat and it will be Dr. Jamie Belsky from Billings Clinic um, talking about the ED process for stroke. And today we've got two fantastic Mission Lifeline volunteers. And we have Penny Clifton, who is the Stroke Program Coordinator at St. Vincent Healthcare, where she's worked for over 30 years. She's a registered nurse with a master's degree in nursing education and certified in stroke neuroscience. And her partner in crime today is D'Amber Coleman. And um, D'Amber Coleman is the manager of clinical education at Holy Rosary Hospital in Miles City. Um, D'Ambra has also been the clinical educator at Miles Community College, and she really loves that. She's been able to have a sweet blend of both nursing and education. So we're really fortunate to have both of you here today. So thank you so much. And just, um, just one bit of housekeeping that I forgot to mention was that if you have a question that comes up during um, this webinar, if you would please type it into the Q&A and not into the chat, then I can make sure we can get those questions asked and answered. Um, at the end of our project, so, or the end of our webinar. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Deambra uh, to kick off our webinar. Thanks, ladies. Hi, um, and thank you for joining us for the Mission Lifeline educational event. My name, um, like Joni said, is Deambra Coleman, and I am joined by um, Penny Clifton. Um, so we both work um, for Sisters of Charity of Livingworth Hospital in Montana, St. Vincent Healthcare and Holy Rosary Healthcare, respectively. And these hospitals are recipients of the hospital grants to build a stroke system in, um, of care in Montana. That um, cancel thing isn't right in the middle of the screen, is it, that I'm seeing? Guess not, okay. <laughs> All right. So of course, as educators, we've got to talk about our objectives. So our objectives today, at the end of this presentation, you should be able to list the eligibility requirements, contraindications and warnings for all to place in the three and the extended four and a half hour windows. Also, we, we are hoping that you can describe preparation of the patient for all to place, such as head CT, exclusion list, blood pressure control, blood glucose. Also describe dosing, um, admixture and administration of all to place and describe nursing care, surveillance for, and treatment of undesirable side effects. So while myocardial infarction patients have had stents and angioplasty and bypass surgery and balloon pumps and pacemakers and implanted cardioverts, stroke has pretty much had the public education and TPA. We first started to be able to use TPA for stroke in 1995, but the window was so small for treatment and the public did not quite grasp the time sensitive nature of something that really didn't hurt or scare them like an MI did. And so even today, many patients arrive outside the treatment windows. So first we'll begin with a, just a general discussion of thrombus and embolus, clotting, and where these are and where these lytic um, drugs fit. The term lice means to break down. And so a thrombolytic or fibrin, fibrinolytic breaks down thrombus which is made of fibrin strands that entrap platelets. And there are three tissue plasminogen activators or TPA drugs. So we have the retoplase, the altoplase, and the tenecteplase. Retoplase and tenecteplase have historically been used in coronary quad and altoplase in brain quad. There is new literature that shows that tenecteplase or TNK may be a bit stronger, equally safe, and equal in terms of outcomes to altoplase. Penny? So the clotting cascade is really overwhelming for most nurses. So I'll try to simplify this a little bit and give you some added value by mentioning some of the other things that you may be familiar with with clotting. In a really simplified fashion, blood in blood vessels is pretty much just fluid and plumbing. And if there's a leak, the fluid has to gel quickly to plug that leak and we call this hemostasis. All the chemicals and factors that are necessary to create a web of fibrin to trap platelets and make that gel plug 
those are circulating in the bloodstream at all times, right alongside the chemicals that are gonna be there to break down the clot when it's no longer needed. All of these clotting factors are made by the liver, which is why when you've cared for somebody with liver disease or long-standing alcoholism, they bruise easily and they don't clot well. Now, as soon as tissue is torn, there's an item called tissue factor that will ignite this pathway and in sequence, cause this sort of downstream reaction, creating one factor, changing it from an inactive form to an active form. We call this pathway the extrinsic pathway because tissue factor is not in the bloodstream, it's external to the bloodstream, comes from the tissue during trauma. The other pathway is called the intrinsic pathway and all of these factors, they have to be exposed to something foreign like plastic in order to get triggered. So. This is why patients with artificial valves get anticoagulated. This is why people getting heart casts are placed on heparin. Whether this is the intrinsic or the extrinsic pathway, regardless of the path, the end result is that prothrombin becomes thrombin and then thrombin changes fibrinogen, which is cryoprecipitate by the way, floating in the bloodstream, changes it into fibrin strands and those fibrin strands, they catch platelets like fish in a net. Now in this diagram, if you see where the red stars are, that's where heparin works. And Coumadin is where the blue stars work. And you can see that we check the action of Coumadin with a protime because Coumadin works mostly in the tissue pathway. And we check heparin with a PTT because it works mostly in the intrinsic pathway. I also want to point out to you in the light pink box there, there's all those new drugs that are used for um, anticoagulation for patients like with atrial fib, Eliquis, Xarelto, Dabigatran, or Pradaxa, that's where those work. In the bright pink boxes, for those of you familiar with trauma care, the bright pink boxes go along with that bright pink star on prothrombin. Now remember, these medications are designed to help the patient to make clot, not to break down clot. And finally, you can see where antiplatelets like aspirin and Plavix work directly on the fibrin clot to make the platelets a little less sticky. TPAs work at the place where plasminogen would work on plasmin to break down fibrin bonds. That's where the TPAs actually work. Now, as an ischemic stroke happens due to a thrombus or an embolus, there's a formation of a plug inside of an artery thrombus forms within the brain artery. Now these are often these little thrombi, they are often smaller and more distal in the brain circulation. These are the kinds of strokes that are caused by smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, inactivity. But an embolus, however, is a clot that's sent into the brain from elsewhere to plug an artery. So these are the kind of clots that come from sludge in the carotids. These are the clots that come from atrial fib. These are the clots that come from an akinetic piece of myocardium after an MI. These are bigger events and they tend to cause a much larger geography of brain tissue to go without blood, such as what is circled in the dotted line in the image there, where the clot has plugged off just at the place where the carotid artery enters the head and becomes the middle cerebral artery. Now, remember stroke is a time sensitive illness and for every minute of ischemia, there is a known degree of brain cell and brain wiring death. Stroke is not a killer, it's a disabler. So when we treat patients with lytic drugs like TNK and TPA, we are helping to reduce the size of the stroke, which then lessens the disability by preserving brain tissue. People given these meds, they can still have some completed stroke, but with these medications, that completed stroke area is smaller and they're left with more healthy brain that can relearn what the stroke area used to do. In the original studies back in the early 1990s, they produced out the place, the patients who got it were more likely to be living independently in their homes three months afterwards than those who did not. Now, Alteplace was only ever tested in people who are 18 years of age and older. There are some pediatric hospitals that have built stroke programs and TPA programs for children, but I need you to know that it's not FDA approved for them. And so it takes these specialty places with multiple layers of expertise and access to pediatric expertise to successfully use TPA in that population. Hopefully that will change in the future for the rest of us, because certainly at least here at St. Vincent's, we've seen more pediatric stroke in the last two years with COVID than we had in the previous nine to 10 years. It also wasn't tested on um, pregnant people initially, but pregnancy is now no longer an absolute exclusion. It's a risk benefit discussion. Now, obviously it can't be given to someone who has hemorrhage on their brain CT 
uh, which is why we do the CT first when they come into the ED. And in general, can't be given to people who have had recent surgeries, strokes, GI bleeds, or brain issues within the past three months, because it might increase the bleeding risk with those people. Now, as a caveat to the surgical thing, I'll let you know that we have successfully used Alteplase on a number of patients after total knee and total hip replacement who were, for all intents and purposes, they were taken off of their atrial fib medication and they had their stroke in their post-operative time period. And um, the orthopedic surgeons were willing to let us go ahead and use the TPA and we've had good outcomes without bleeding issues. So just so you know, there are some surgical candidates there that might still be good candidates for TPA. Also want you to recognize that there's a time window for Alteplase. It needs to be given to persons whose stroke by history or as assessed on MRI isn't over four and a half hours since its start. Giving it to brains that have been stroking longer than that, the brain tissue is a little bit more fragile and instead of helping them, you're really more likely to make them bleed. I mentioned the MRI piece so that all of you will take some time um, after we're done with this webinar and I want you to become familiar with what the treatment plan is for what's called a wake up stroke. People who go to bed normal and wake up with the stroke in the morning, we used to rule them out because their timeless no wall was real far away, but now you can use MRI to fit them into the TPA treatment window. Now at SVH and Holy Rosary, we have built this exclusion checklist for TPA into a smart phrase in our EMR. We did this because we don't expect anybody to remember it and because it also gives you know a record of the fact that we did almost like a handoff, go through a list of things and make sure we reassured ourselves that we hadn't missed an exclusion factor for the patient. This seems like a really long list in general, doesn't it? but it can kind of be covered with a list of questions. Have you been in the hospital in the last three months? What for? Have you ever had bleeding in your head or been told you have an aneurysm? Are you taking any medications that slow down your blood clotting? Are you or could you be pregnant? The relative considerations are the ones where the doctor and the patient have to make a decision about whether the risk of the event or the stroke disability is greater than the risk the patient would be exposed to if we um, gave them the TPA. So the CAT scan first and foremost, can't show any bleeding. You should not be able to see a dark hypodense area on the CAT scan because that would make you think this stroke has been going on longer than you think it has. It takes about four to six hours for that hypodensity to show up. If the blood sugar is high or low, it's not a reason not to give it, but you gotta start treating it. Cause as you know, even though hypoglycemia doesn't cause focal neurologic deficits, it does make people weird neurologically. So you do need to start to treat those sugars. If the patient's on warfarin or Coumadin and the anticoagulation effect from warfarin can be measured, as you know, by an INR, send the blue top tube to the lab to get the number. You can start the alteplase, but if the INR comes back at 1.7, you gotta turn it off. The same is true for platelet count. Um, with platelet count, we want it to be of a certain height before we can give the out to place. But again, send the purple top tube for the lab and watch for that platelet count to come back um, so that if the platelet count is low, um, under 100,000, you can stop the out to place, but it's not a reason to not, to not give it. And finally with blood pressure. So it says 185 over 110 um, despite treatment. <laughs> but really um, leave the blood pressure up until you're sure that you're going to move forward and then start pushing it down aggressively. And we'll talk about that um, in, in, in just a minute here. So let's, um, we're gonna look at an example real quickly and just see about some decision-making. A 52 year old rancher at 1130 in the morning, he is witnessed to have sudden left hemiparesis and left facial droop, dysarthria or slurring of speech and he cannot see to the left, we call that a hemianopia. He has a result, has a right gaze preference. He's looking to the right because that's the only direction he can see in. And you could say in effect, he's looking at the stroke. When we add all this up, he's got an NIH of 12 to 14. We look through his surgical history and find that, uh-oh, he's had an anterior cervical fusion within the last two months. So the questions that we're gonna ask is this, is he in the treatment window? Yes, he is. He got to the hospital within 45 minutes of the witnessed start to the stroke. Are there any absolute exclusions? Well, kinda. That cervical fusion does make you concerned because he's had surgery on his vertebral column within the last two months. Are there any relative exclusions? Well, you could take that cervical fusion and say, if I leave this guy at an NIH of 12 to 14 and I don't treat his stroke, he will not return to this ranching activity. He will not be able to drive. 
He will not be able to operate, um, operate heavy equipment. And it really will change the trajectory of his life at the age of 52. So this is where a risk benefit discussion comes in between the provider and the patient. And they did opt to go ahead and treat him. The blood pressure medications and the aspirin are not a rule out. His CAT scan was negative for bleed or hypodensity. There was no rule out there. And that blood pressure, that is not so high that we couldn't give him the TPA. And if we needed to drive it lower, we certainly could. So really at this point with this guy, there was no reason not to treat him. It was going to be a disabling stroke. He was given out to place. He was flown here to St. Vincent Healthcare um, for a thrombectomy. We pulled clot out of his right ICA and middle cerebral artery. And if you took him from the time that he started his stroke at 1130 to the time I plopped him into the ICU after his thrombectomy, we had him within six and a half hours. He had a really wonderful outcome and should be able to return um, to running his own ranch, which is what your ultimate goal is. D'Ambra? Thank you. So since time is brain, the Joint Commission and the American Heart Stroke Associations both require that the hospitals strive to shorten their door to needle times. So under 60 minutes from arrival is mandatory for us as a goal. However, under 45 minutes is better. Getting our processes streamlined to achieve this helps to save the brain. The processes are early recognition by the EMD dispatcher, early recognition by our EMS, um, accurate radio alert about stroke, team processes in the ED, so assessments in the CT is fast because they are before the drug. And this drug does not need to be mixed by a pharmacist or under a hood. It can be mixed at the bedside by a trained RN. Moving the drug out of the pharmacy can, um, really helps to drop the dorsal needle times. So stroke is an arterial event. So therefore there are some artery blood pressure things that are required for safety. Um, I like to think about this as if I am turning a garden hose on to a really dry earth. The pressures of the stream can either blast the soil into the air or it can just gently wet it. So in stroke, we need to um, control that blood pressure so that when that clot hopefully releases, we aren't just damaging the downstream brain with a reperfusion injury from blasted with a high blood pressure. The other way to think about this is also that letting the blood pressure um, be high, but not too high, gets the blood into the collateral arterial circulation that can sort of backfill the ischemic tissue until the full reperfusion um, can occur. Blood pressure management begins after the CT has ruled out an endocranial bleed and you are considering the TPA. Start with the easy drug like labetalol as long as the patient doesn't have a slow heart rate. Give it a couple times and if you can't get where you need to with the blood pressure, you need a drip. You can give more labetalol if you don't have drips, but you do have risk of cardiac inhibition. Our preferred drips are the calcium channel blockers, the nicardipine and the clavidipine, excuse me, <laughs> plug them in down close to the patient so you don't waste time with the med piggybacked way up high, taking forever to reach that patient. You want to titrate it as quickly as the manufacturer suggests. Remember, you are trying to get them to TPA candidacy ASAP. So some other care. Go. Sorry, sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's advancing itself, which is oh. weird, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. So some other care and safety pieces are um, number one, you're going to need two IV sites. Many e ED get these um, right after the they return from um, the ED. Be sure that you use a real and not estimated weight, known which stretchers in the ED have scales and get stroke onto them. There is solid nursing research about estimating weight that says we aren't really good at it. We also, it's, excuse me, this does not need to be um, a signed piece of paper-informed paper consent, but there does need to be evidence of discussion um, because there are some risks with the TPA. The biggest concern is, of course, the bleeding. There can be little microbleeds, hemorrhagic transformation after the TPA. The rate of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhagic transformation is two to seven patients per 100 that are treated. We built templates into our um, EMR so providers can easily indicate the discussion and the outcome. There is, of course, the ability to use it as an emergency and not seek consent. Time is brain. If you are putting 20 to 30 minutes into making a call looking for family, that's costing the patient brain. So another process is, and skill set to work on. 
Also, because of infection, the national push is to not use catheters, but if you must, put it in 30 minutes after the TPA infusion finishes to reduce the bleeding. You can put it in first, but it can't delay the TPA. There has been a lot of discussion about TNK tenecteplase as an alternative to the TPA alteplase. Benefits are that it is a single bolus, so less math, less equipment, and fewer steps. It appears to have the same safety profile and the same contraindications and exclusions. It appears to be non-inferior to TPA in outcomes and bleeding risk. And there is some early evidence that it might be a better drug in large clot thrombectomy type patients because it is a bit hungrier per se for fibrin than TPA is but it is not FDA approved and nationally accepted yet. But that doesn't mean you can't use it. And since you would be using it for the reason for which it is intended, my understanding that, it, that this is not off label for which there would need to be a lot of patient and family discussion. Penny? Sure. So let's quickly go over the steps to mixing TPA. And Deambra, I'll, I'll just have you jump in when your next slide comes up because I sure. forget how we divided these. <laughs> All right. In the kit, you're going to get a vial of powdered altiplase and a vial of sterile water in which you're going to dissolve that powder. There's a transfer device that connects the two bottles. You put the transfer device into the center of the top of the vial of fluid and then center the top of the powder vial over that spike and spike the powder vial. Gently invert and the fluid will drain downhill into the powder. Gently swirl to mix. Don't agitate it. Don't shake it upside down. This is a gentle swirl in it like a martini kind of swirl. And when the foam settles and all of your math is done, you can withdraw any waste from the bottle, that's drug you're not going to use, and just actually spike that admixture vial onto the tubing. Remember that the vial has one milligram of altiplase per cc. Be very careful with making sure that you do get right in the center of that, um, center of that circle when you do that admixture spike. Notice that the person in the picture there is using gloves and doing the best to make this a sterile creation for sure, but it does not need to be done underneath of a hood in a pharmacy. Um, so the drug can and should be mixed at the bedside and that definitely reduces um, timing. Let's talk about the math a little bit. So I'm gonna include a little TNK math here, but we're gonna focus on uh, TPA altiplase. Altiplase is weight-based. No patient, no matter how much they weigh, can get more than 90 milligrams. And some of the original studies with TPA did use varying doses, and that's how they've decided upon this 90 milligram dose. You're going to calculate the total dose based on the patient's weight. And again, recognize that nobody goes over 90 milligrams. If you're using a 100 milligram vial, you will withdraw and discard the volume that you're not going to be using on this patient. What is left in the vial is the patient's dose. 10% of that total dose will be given as a bolus over one minute. Some people draw this up in a syringe and label it and then give the infusion out of the remaining bottle. Um, you do not want to give that bolus infusion with that needle, if that's how you're gonna do it, until you're ready to start the infusion. And I'll tell you why. If you put that bolus into that patient as an IV push with a, with a syringe and you're not ready to start that drip, the patient's blood level of lytic will plummet and then you start the drip and it's a slow climb for them. The goal of this is to give them a big rampant shot of a lytic to ramp up their lysis level in their bloodstream and then follow it with the infusion. So there can't be any gap between the two. So this is where your, you know, your skill set really comes into play with getting this thing mixed, getting the tubing flushed, drawing up the waste and being ready to kind of do the whole thing all together. Now, remember that the remaining 90% of the patient's dose is still in the vial. You're gonna plug tubing into that vial. Your tubing needs to be non-vented. It shouldn't have any little rubbery Y ports in it. Read the package. The package that comes in will tell you what the prime volume is of that tubing, and you're gonna need that information for later. Here at St. Vincent's, our tubing, I think has a prime volume of about 20 cc's. It's important for you to know that because if you, you're gonna run this on a pump, and you're gonna set the pump up to alarm when the dose is done, but 
you need to roll it back a little bit and have the pump tell you when all but the tubing prime is done. So all but about 20 cc's of the medication is in because that way you can hang a little bag of saline on top of that TPA tubing and reset the pump and get the rest of that TPA in. Uh, we found that that was um, a, a gap that was missing sometimes for transport crews and people that transported patients with TPA running. They thought when the pump alarmed that the drug was done and they would just take it down and they would end up shorting the patient medication that was actually in the tubing. Now we use our bottle here as the infusion bag at St. V's. We um, have the Alaris guardrail pump system um, and we hand program the pump based on the patient's weight to calculate not only the dose and it kind of confirms the dose for us because we do the math by hand, confirm the dose for us and the machine then automatically you can set up for what your volume to be infused is. And that way the machine will let you know when all that's left is the stuff that's in the tubing and that's the point at which you hang your saline. So again, just as a reminder, when you set the pump up, make sure it's gonna let you know when all you have left is tubing prime so that you can hang some saline behind it at the same rate, finish that TPA right up. Never use primary non-vented, use primary tubing. This is always a primary line. You're not piggybacking alteplase into anything and you never piggyback anything into alteplase, obviously. Use primary tubing, never piggyback anything into the alteplase, never piggyback the alteplase into anything. Now I had said something to you about um, the consent stuff and I just wanted to show you that not only do we have, and this you might be able to do this at your facilities too, we built all of our different consents into smart phrases and we also built the math in here so that the nurses can do it together and can co-sign it. Now let's talk about the monitoring after alteplase. Is this you, Amber? Yes, ma'am, it is, go. thank okay. you. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. So monitoring after the alt place. So there is a national standard, the same at every hospital everywhere. And so for vitals and neuros after the alt place. So starting at the time of the bolus, vitals and neuros are every 15 minutes for three hours, then every 30 for six, and then hourly until the transfer out of the ICU order is written. Use the top three um, LOC pieces of the NIH and revisit um, one of two deficits is your neuro check, not the full NIH. That is um, neither necessary nor practical. Obviously, there's a lot involved there. A full NIH at transfer and shift start um, is required though, however. We also wanna treat fevers early as the brain is one degree Celsius hotter than the body. We want to treat elevated or low blood glucose. We want to avoid any punctures for 24 hours if at all possible. All patients get at least um, sequential compression sleeves on their legs, not TEDs. TEDs don't fit or work um, for VTE prophylaxis. We also wanna make sure we're conducting a swallow screen before the first oral intake and controlling the blood pressure to keep it under the 180 over 105 for 24 hours after the alteplase to protect, um, protect the brain from re a reperfusion injury while preventing a hypoperfusion injury as well. So let's talk about those frequent neuro assessments. The certified NIH scale is the assessment tool that was built for the NINDS TPA drug trials and has remained the most valid way to assess and quantify and prognosticate <laughs> stroke, excuse me. But it is 11 steps and hard to learn. And you absolutely cannot do this every 15 minutes. It's too much for you and way, way too much for brain work for that patient. So we do one before we start the TPA and then we drill down to gather just the most important and sensitive pieces. So in the brain, the thing that changes the first is the level of consciousness. So keep the top three LOC pieces. They're basically Glasgow coma, right? And then you have two choices. Go back and revisit a deficit or use the approved abbreviated NIH that is um, LOC and limbs. If your patient did not have limbs in their original presentation, that's the kind of person you assess something else on. Remember, we're trying to catch a complication or a deterioration and really will change its level of consciousness. At St. Vincent's, we build the NIH badge cards that have single words to remind nurses of the steps. We require every nurse in the ED, ICU, stroke, and telemetry floors demonstrate competencies annually. 
So a few more post alt-place care pieces that we need to consider. So the drug does not last real long, but you don't want to be risking bleeding in the first 24 hours. So we don't poke them or give them any blood thinning medications. We've already mentioned the VTE mechanical prophylaxis in the swallow screen. These folks will need to be in an ICU for about 24 hours, but considering COVID, of course, in the last few years, we've actually implemented a low intensity monitoring protocol for the lower NIH patients, as well as an early out of the ICU plan. There are plenty um, of post alt place patients who are stable enough at 16 hours to move forward. There's no rule about bed rest after alt place, but there are some safety pieces to consider. Are they a fall risk? They cannot be allowed to drop their blood pressure as it can hurt their brain. And big strokes are really fragile with brain oxygen needs. Two on the one hand, maybe getting um, out of bed to a commode is a lot of work, but so is um, agitated patients who can't um, go to a bedpan. So you just need to use your judgment um, within the first 24 hours, um, bathroom, bedside commode, you know, whatever is most appropriate um, for that patient. Penny? Okay, so any braid obviously can bleed after alteplase. The risk again is about two to seven patients out of a hundred. And that is for bleeds that actually increase the NIH and affect outcome. It's not a high risk rate. Now, if I had to predict the patient who was gonna be the biggest bleed risk after alteplase, it would be a diabetic person because they have fragile end arterioles at baseline because of their diabetes people who have high NIH scores and large strokes because there was a lot of brain involved, people for whom you really had to fight to get that blood pressure under control um, before you treated them and for the first 24 hours afterwards, and patients for whom we didn't do a good job with controlling their hyperglycemia. Those things, diabetes, large stroke, end of the treatment window, high BP, high BG, those are things that are all linked to an increased risk of intracerebral hemorrhage after TPA. Should the patient complain of headache or probably most importantly, alter their level of consciousness after this alteplase has started, stop the drug, take the tubing down, call the provider, prepare to go to CAT scan. You're not gonna restart the drug, so just stop it and take it down so nobody gives it by accident. You will need a CAT scan. Now, a fibrinogen level um, could be checked, but there's really only theoretical antidotes to, um, to a TPA-related bleed at this point. You can use cryoprecipitate, it's always possible to give blood, but people, unless they're using blood, losing blood somewhere else, but in their head, I, I can't see where that would be relevant. You could certainly use a platelet transfusion. And I have seen folks use the medications um, that go along with um, uh, uh, trauma that we talked about before. So again, you're going to note a neuro check deterioration. The patient will complain of headache with or without nausea, vomiting, stop the drug, take it down, cap the site, call the provider. You're going to CAT scan, but you may find yourself giving TXA. You may end up giving aminocoproic acid or amicar, which is an antifibrinolytic agent. Um, even if you're going to check a serum fibrinogen, you could always start with 10 to 20 units of cryo while you're waiting for the results to come back. But probably most importantly, you're going to need a stat non-contrast head CT. So I pulled that um, horrific clotting pathway forward just to show you where these antidotes would work. So cryo would help at the intrinsic pathway to push clot formation. PCC, fresh frozen plasma, vitamin K, factor 7A would work in both pathways to push clot formation. Amicar would help stop the patient from breaking down their own clot. And then cryoprecipitate, of course, would um, help the patient to build more fibrin rather than what the TPA is doing, which is breaking up fibrin. The other complication I want you to be aware of is called angioedema. So oropharyngeal angioedema will present itself originally as lip swelling, but it can progress to an acute airway obstruction very quickly. So this needs to be a standard part of nursing assessment. When they go in to do vitals and neuro checks, you have the patient stick their tongue out and you take a look at them for swelling as well. The patients that seem to be the biggest risk for this, and for reasons I can't explain, are the patients who are on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, the ACE inhibitor drugs, which are the ones that end with pril, like captopril and enalapril. Now this is, for all intents and purposes, an allergic reaction. So you're gonna treat it in much the same way as you treat anaphylaxis with epi, benadryl, and solumedrol. 
Okay, Amber? so yeah, thank you. So let's yeah. look at this um, practice scenario. So our EMS report. So we have a 60 year old male. He's a contractor. Last uh, known well was 2200. He was found down at 2400 mute, not moving right arm or leg, had a right face droop, gaze to the left. He has a history of AFib, but start, stopped his eloquence. His blood glucose is 135. His oxygen saturations are at 98%. Blood pressure 188 over 112, heart rate 100. Um, we start an IV. Um, he's got um, he's on 15 um, liters per minute by a non rebreather, and we're estimating out at about 10 minutes. So nursing. So some things for us as nurses to start being uh, to prepare our um, to receive. We're going to notify our provider. We're also going to make sure that CT is waiting. They understand that we've got someone coming in. Also let pharmacy know. Um, we want to anticipate on arrival a rapid ABC and fast assessment. We want to set the monitor to do those every 15 uh, minute vital signs. We want to try to go ahead and get that second IV in, send of course the rainbow of tubes to the lab. We may need to look at that blood uh, pressure, so be prepared to control that. Someone will need to do an exclusion list, so hopefully you have that built into your EMR. If not, having a handy um, checklist is appropriate. And then also make sure that um, we have the neuro prepared um, for a consult after we have that CT. So let's just kind of look about this. So after they're coming back from a CT, we're going to try to do to get a full NIH exam, which we're going to give him a 19 and we're going to talk through this. So history, um, he has had COVID three months ago. He found um, AFib. He had stopped his eloquence when the, um, when the prescription ran out. No surgeries or major trauma or bleeding in the last three months. And he has no history of any brain bleeding. So here are the meds that we found. So he takes a daily aspirin, a daily statin. He's on metoprolol. And then the Prinavil. So right there, that's what Penny was talking about as an angioedema risk. And then, of course, the hydrochlorothiazide. Well, we get a weight. He's 350. Um, and we're trying to wean him down um, to 94% um, on his oxygen. So let's look at his NIH. So for his level of consciousness, um, we're going to go ahead and just give him the one. Excuse me, my thing just kind of went away there because he's drowsy. Um, and then response to level of consciousness questions. So we're going to go ahead and mark him a two he, because he answers neither correctly. Response to level of consciousness commands. So Z, or I'm sorry, Z, I don't know where I got that zero. <laughs> I apologize. Um, obeys both correctly. Um, pupillary response, we're going to do a one for the normal for sensory. Gaze, he's going to get a one for partial gaze palsy, um, two for language for the severe aphasia, two for visual fields for complete hemianesthesia, two for facial palsy for the partial paralysis, two for dysarthria for severe, and zero for the extinctions um, for normal. So then that is where we got our 19 score. So I'm just going to interject here for a Thank second because I pulled this um, NIH scale over I don't, from some article somewhere. I, pupils should not be in there. I just want to make sure everybody recognizes that. That's why there's no score next to it. I'm not really sure why this one had pupils in it, but pupils is not part of NIH. <laughs> and everybody who's listening, I'm sure they recognize that. Here's your next slide. Thank you. So neurologist, um, he reviews the CT. He determines there's no bleeding, no hypodensity, but visible clot in the um, left middle cerebral artery. So he's going to need transfer for the thrombectomy. Um, patient cannot consent. The family is not there um, or they are not answering on the phone. Emergency consent um, is what we'll use for disabling event. Um, also, he stopped the eloquence, so not an exclusion. And his platelet count came back at 112. His blood pressure is still up to 195 over 110 with a heart rate of 102. So we give him the 10 milligrams um, of the labelalol. Blood pressure 177 over 90, heart rate 90. We're gonna still monitor every 15 minutes and retreat to keep under the 180 over 105 after the alteplase. Mixing our drugs. 
so we've got that 350 um, over the 2.2 so equals the 159 kilograms. We're going to take the 159 times it by our the 0 0.9 milligrams per kilo, and that's going to give us the 143 milligrams. But max dose is 90, which is what Penny had talked about earlier. So we're going to do nine milligram bolus over one minute and 81 milligrams infusion over the hour. We're going to make a transfer call and for care, vital signs, neurocheck. We're going to keep them in PO and the head of the bed upright. Penny? You bet. Now, this presentation today for all of you was open to anybody in Montana, but there are going to be nurses and providers out there in some of our essential critical access hospitals who may not be in facilities that have CAT scans. Now, when we were onboarding our clot retrieval providers, we made it a point to orient them not only to the size of the state, because patients really have to travel far to get to care, but we also needed them to be aware of who could be reached by helicopter, and we need them to be aware of which facilities don't have scanners. It's circled in black on this map, which we threw together to help our providers here, are the facilities that don't currently have scanners. And so any patients received at those facilities would have to be transported somewhere else to get the scan that would determine whether or not they could get TPA. And I think the thing to consider here is it may not be in the patient's best interest, even though they may eventually land in Billings, it may not be in their best interest to come to Billings to get their TPA. So let's look for, for example, at, um, at Jordan, Circle, and Terry. So Terry and Jordan might be better served to go to Miles City. Um, Circle, Weibo might be better served to go to Glendive. Um, Wolf Point could transfer to Poplar uh, for scanning and treatment. So as we build our stroke system of care, we need to be thinking about um, getting the patient to the, the care that they need. And in this situation, what they need is a CAT scan, a scanner and a drug, getting them there and then transporting them to the higher um, level of care um, in, with an intensive care unit for their post-TPA monitoring. So for Jordan Circle, Wolf Point, Terry, Weibo, Ikalaka, Broadus, Landier, Colstrip, their next higher level of care is the place with the CAT scanner, not necessarily making that patient go all the way to Billings if we can get that drug at a closer place. So it's hard to develop expertise. It happens in a really rare event, something that maybe happens twice a year. What are the process pieces that can help? Well, I would encourage anybody who's currently participating in a trauma system at their hospital, and there are a lot of critical access hospitals out there who are trauma receiving facilities. I want you to, you people turn your eyes towards stroke because everything that you did to meet the criteria to be a trauma receiving facility, these teams, and the team responses and the care paths and the rapid imaging, all that stuff is going to be the same type of processes you're going to apply to stroke. It all starts with a gap analysis. Do we have the drug? Who can mix it? Who could mix it? Could we train nurses to mix it? Do we have a CT? Is the tech here all the time? If not, how fast can they be here? And are they willing to take call that way? Who reads our images after hour? How fast do they read their images? How fast do we get that reply on those images? Because we have to get it back quickly. And probably most importantly, do our EMS providers who bring patients to us, do they know how to identify stroke and what language to use on the radio that will get our attention and ping our radars that something acute and treatable is coming in? Finally, do our ED staff, both nurses and doctors, feel solid in their stroke assessment skills? The biggest resource gap though, I think, is that very few of us have a neurologist on call and there is a value to talking to somebody on the phone, but I gotta tell you, stroke and stroke assessment is a very visual thing. And I personally think that the whole concept of telestroke and letting a neurologist lay eyes on that patient and guide your examination will pick up stuff that maybe you didn't pick up or it'll pick up stuff that you couldn't relay accurately just in trying to say what the patient looked like on the phone. So I can't emphasize enough how important the use of telestroke services are. So the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services Cardiovascular Division has had a stroke work group since about 2005, maybe even longer than that. It's made of anybody that was involved in stroke care. The overarching goal of this group was to improve public recognition of stroke and to expedite care across the state. And by care, I mean Alteplase. Any facility with a CAT scan should have it. 
but the usage has historically across the state really been very low. The work group has designed order sets. It has published guidelines. We have a huge website of resources. And most importantly, the state offers a telestroke program. Here is our friend, Dr. Lindsay from Kalispell Regional Medical Center, a huge proponent for stroke care and currently leading the group of neurologists who were on call to deliver telestroke services to help you make TPA decisions by helping with assessment. Please reach out to Joni Guzman and the American Heart Association who are sponsoring this education if you want to be connected to somebody in DPHHS about telestroke. Along with telestroke, the state also built a program to encourage smaller facilities to build excellence in stroke care. So let's take a look at their outcomes. We have better capture of the last time known well, because we remember we need to know that for out to place consideration. We have uh, more patients um, being assessed with an NIH stroke scale, scale than we used to before the telestroke stuff and the state stroke processes went into place. And we have a big drop in how long it took for the, uh, from the time the patient arrived until they got their CAT scan read, because you know they got to get their CAT scan read before you can make a TPA decision. And finally, and most importantly, take a look at the progress that's been made in increasing the amount of patients who get their TPA put into them in less than 60 minutes. Amber. So in summary, um, Alteplace has proven to be an effective in reducing the extent of disability in an eligible ischemic stroke patient. So remember, if treated within four and a half hours of known stroke start, the goal is door to needle time of less than or equal to 60 minutes, but faster, of course, is better. If administered with careful clean, can, excuse me, careful clinical decision making with respect to contraindications and warnings. So using the telestroke for access to assessment and decision tools. If the patient is adequately prepared, such as blood pressure and glucose management is initiated. And if the care during the acute phase incorporates comprehensive and evidence-based stroke medical and nursing interventions, such as vitals, neuros, aspiration protection, and blood pressure control. So this is our reference list, and um, we've got about 13 minutes left online here, and I'm going to um, stop sharing the screen. The reference list is, of course, available from Joni or myself or D'Ambra, but I'm going to stop sharing just in case there are any questions. Great. Great job. Thanks, ladies. We do have a question that came in, so hold on here, and it's from Todd. And Todd, I can read, or you can feel free to come off mute and um, read it too. Um, but since I'm here, Todd's asking, is there a time frame parameter or criteria when they were last on Eliquis? In this case, that voids the exclusion. For example, one week versus six months ago. Yeah, Todd, the rule that I've seen has been 24 hours. That's what we've applied here. So let's say they take it at nine o'clock in the morning and they show up right now at one o'clock in the afternoon the next day and they haven't taken their dose yet. And their last dose was yesterday at nine, we'd probably treat them. Thanks, Penny. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mike came out with a question and said, with more, with Montana more available um, in the state, can you talk about TPA versus no TPA for Montana eligible patients? I need to, let's rephrase that a minute. I'm not sure okay. I quite got that question. Right. Okay. Oh, sorry, Todd. It says he can't see access to come up. <laughs> Might be how I set it up. I'll have That's to how adjust we set that it up for, for you, time. Todd. Yeah. <laughs> Permanently muted. Oh, with Montana, with mechanical from back to me more available in the state, can you talk about TPA versus no TPA for um, from sure. back to me eligible patients? Sure. Sorry, Mike. So, so let's just consider back the size of the state, just saying. So Montana will go thrombectomy. We've got, we've got some availability at St. Patrick's. We've got some availability at Billings Clinic, and we've got some availability here. Considering the size of the state, I personally don't feel like it's available to everybody. And remember, TPA is, TPA is the be-all, end-all. So anybody who should get TPA needs to get TPA, Mike. It is not a rule out for thrombectomy. And in fact, a handful of the people we've done here, we've done 10 since October, and there's a chunk of them that got TPA first. There's no increased risk. Drug has a really short half-life um, and they can have both, can and should have both. 
You should not um, choose thrombectomy over alteplase. You should get, get the alteplase into them and head towards thrombectomy if they're candidates, you bet. Thanks, Penny. Um, another question that came in is, what is the reason for non-venting IV tubing with the glass alteplase bottle? That is a great question. And what one of the things we found that we've had to do is vent the bottle like with a, with a needle, because you're right, you have to put some air in for the fluid to come out. But if you, and I think by vented tubing, what I meant is nothing with Y ports on it. Let's put it that way. So it just can't have anything with Y ports on it. That's a safety thing. So maybe vented wasn't, maybe that wasn't the right terminology to use because she's right. You can't get anything to come out of a bottle unless you vent it. Okay. Kristen said, perfect, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions or comments? You do have um, some kudos on there too, ladies. So I hope you look at those. Where do I look for, for our kudos in the chat? Look on the, in the chat. Okay. Yes. Well, thanks very much. They've been a lovely audience. <laughs> they have been. <laughs> Faces <Great. and> muted. <laughs> it was a great presentation. All right. Thank you so thanks, much. Mike. If there's any other questions, Joni, I know that you know how to send emails to both of us. So, okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Thank you all for attending. And um, like I said, we'll be having our next Montana Fast Chat on March 31st with Dr. Jamie Belsky from Billings Clinic. And I think we've got a total of 12 that we plan on doing over the next year. Um, and then we will have this closed captioned and available on the montanastroke.org website, as well as our Mission Lifeline Montana Stroke website. So please reach out with any questions. And thanks everyone for attending. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Are they all?